ladies and gentlemen, in the absence of any other instructions, I would just uh, start the session. Um, welcome uh, to our um, afternoon session on green hydrogen in developing and emerging economies, maximizing potential and avoiding pitfalls. It's a session in which we plan to really take a deep dive into the opportunities that uh, come with this new emerging technology uh, to countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. And um, I think we have, uh, we have a very good foundation from this uh, morning sessions with many, many interesting and astute um, interventions and presentations uh, to, to undertake this deep dive and to really try to understand how developing countries, emerging markets of the South can best harness in a long-term transitional um, perspective the opportunities uh, that um, come with this new technology, but also avoid the pitfalls that might lie ahead when you engage in uh, a technology that is really at a very, very initial uh, stage of its um, market potential. So um, we've heard uh, this morning the, the case for action, so I will not um, say much more uh, to this because the, the whole um, uh, climate agenda, the need to, to act uh, in, a, in a dramatic um, and, and very concentrated uh, fashion um, and the role that green hydrogen um, has to play in a, in a 1.5 uh, um, uh, degree scenario, I think that has been articulated uh, by many speakers um, this morning. What was also um, came out very clearly was the new, let's say, geopolitics, but also geography of a new global energy system that is emerging that different from fossils as we know them, um, the, we have a very wide distribution of cheap renew renewable energy sources, or at least the potential for them in many parts of the world. Um, and many of these uh, resources lie um, in the south, lie around the sunbelt of the globe. Um, and um, many of the countries around that um, geography face um, underlying economic uh, development challenges where green hydrogen should also play a positive role in the future. At the same time, we have a lot of countries, let me say in the north, that uh, will form major demand centers uh, for, for this uh, new energy commodity. So the entire issue of how will the commodity be traded is one thing, but we also, I think, understand that with these new uh, opportunities for countries of the South, we probably also see a new well, aspects of a new division of globe, uh, global division of labor emerging. So there are new opportunities for um, for developing countries and emerging markets to enter into new forms of, of value creation and to try to really play a new role in a new decarbonized uh, global economy by mid-century. So we really want to take a deep dive. Uh, we had some very interesting um, regional aspects already that we heard from. I remember very well the, uh, the, the interview um, with the colleagues from uh, Namibia, very interesting I found. But uh, we now um, have the opportunity to jointly endeavor um, into, um, into a journey through Chile, through South Africa, through Argentina, and um, also to India to um, look more specifically what are the opportunities lying ahead, but as I said, also what may be potential pitfalls to be avoided. My name is Mike Enskart. I work for GIZ, I'm head of uh, unit for in, uh, infrastructure and energy at headquarters of German International Corporation, GIZ. And um, for us also, the, the emerging green hydrogen agenda has already ha have a strong, very strong impact on our portfolio. So we currently work with more or less 30 countries in Latin America and South, um, uh, in South, uh, Southern Asia, but also in Africa. Uh, to help them understand the potential that lies ahead and also help them to, to strategize a little bit how they uh, in future want to engage in these uh, new um, economic technologies and these new technologies and economic uh, sectors. 
I would like to thank the organizers and the Green Hydrogen Organization for giving us the opportunity to, to host this um, panel this afternoon. And I want to share with you a little bit the, the foreseen order. Uh, we will have a, start with a video message now um, from uh, the Minister of Energy from Chile. Um, and then we have a very um, um, interesting and astute um, panel at, which I will introduce to you after the, um, the video message from Claudio Huepe, who is the Minister of uh, Energy for Chile. Um, you're all aware that um, Chile has a very, very um, great uh, resource endowment in terms of um, cheap resources for renewable energies, in terms of sun and wind, but also has a very, was one of the early movers to really strategize on these opportunities uh, that, that are associated with, uh, with green hydrogen. So um, we uh, will have a, about three, four minute video statement now from the minister from Chile, and then I will call up on the panel to join me up here. Um, and we can start the video. Thank you. Muy buenos días a todos y a todas. Quiero enviar un saludo especial a la vicepresidenta tercera y ministra para la transición ecológica del gobierno de España, señora Teresa Rivera, y al chairman de la Green Hydrogen Organization, el honorable señor Malcolm Turnbull, también al gobierno alemán, y la GZ a quienes agradezco calurosamente por la invitación a este importante evento. Chile se ha comprometido a alcanzar la carbono neutralidad para el año 2050 y en eso el hidrógeno verde tendrá un rol importante para el cumplimiento del objetivo. Hemos calculado que se podría colaborar hasta el 27% en la reducción de emisiones para lograr la meta. No obstante, el hidrógeno verde no es para nosotros solo una tecnología para reducir emisiones. Es también un vehículo para avanzar en nuestro proceso de desarrollo. En efecto, lo que buscamos como gobierno es que los proyectos de hidrógeno se conviertan en una industria y que esta industria sea un motor de progreso para el país y para las localidades en las que se inscriben. Estamos diseñando políticas para que esta industria se despliegue fomentando el desarrollo local y nacional con una mirada sistémica e inclusiva que considere los impactos económicos, sociales, culturales y ambientales. Estas políticas articulan los esfuerzos de los diversos sectores, como economía, trabajo, ciencia, medio ambiente, transporte, en fin, pues un encuentro de todas estas dimensiones que construiremos un verdadero desarrollo. No podemos continuar con lógicas desintegradas que van mellando la confianza de la ciudadanía en el potencial de estas nuevas industrias para aportar bienestar duradero. En ese sentido, la cooperación internacional es fundamental para avanzar con la mayor velocidad en el despliegue de la tecnología del hidrógeno permitiendo a diversos países ser parte de esta nueva revolución industrial. La cooperación debe darse en todos los niveles, en proyectos, investigación y desarrollo, buenas prácticas, todo esto de modo de maximizar el potencial de beneficios y evitar costos innecesarios del proceso para todas las partes involucradas. Todos los países debemos alejarnos del modelo basado en los recursos fósiles y progresar conjuntamente buscando el beneficio mutuo y logrando llegar a todos los sectores un beneficio descentralizado que sea visible para las regiones donde desarrollan los proyectos. En Chile se destaca la importancia potencial de las regiones de Antofagasta y de Magallanes y es por eso que queremos relevar el aporte de esta iniciativa Diálogo País Chile Euroclima Plus, donde el gobierno alemán a través de la GIZ, así como el gobierno español, con su agencia de cooperación internacional para el desarrollo, entre otros, han contribuido de manera significativa. Durante los próximos cuatro años esperamos fortalecer el trabajo territorial con el hidrógeno verde para que su potencial se pueda desplegar en más regiones de Chile. Para hacer esto estamos creando no solo las instituciones necesarias sino también un plan de acción concreto que guíe el camino por recorrer. Queremos destacar el aporte de todos los países y organizaciones internacionales que decididamente están trabajando para convertir en realidad el potencial del hidrógeno verde y esperamos poder seguir cooperando para un futuro más verde y más próspero. Muchas gracias a todos. Great. With these Encouraging uh, remarks from, from the minister from Chile. I would like to introduce uh, to you the panel that we have this afternoon. Uh, first of all, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome uh, Minister Matthias Sebastian Kulfas, who is the Minister of Productive Development in Argentina since uh, 2019. He is, has been in this position. And his ministry, please, Minister, join me.
Welcome, and your ministry um, already in uh, 2021 published a Green Productive Development Plan for Argentina, and we uh, really uh, are curious to learn from you uh, what role green hydrogen is playing in this um, ambitious plan that your country has. Next, uh, I would like to welcome uh, Mr. Masofa Mushushuf, um, who is uh, joining us from South Africa. Please. Masofa is the Chief Director for Investment and Unblocking in Infrastructure South Africa, and he's also a Green Economy Specialist in the Investment and Infrastructure Office of the Presidency of the Republic of South Africa. Uh, it's also a great pleasure to welcome uh, from Germany, Elizabeth Taher. Elizabeth works with the German Ministry for Economics and uh, Climate Action. Uh, ministry with a new name. Maybe you will share a little bit the background uh, for this um, new and innovative also uh, denomination of a ministry. Uh, she uh, looks in that ministry after bilateral energy uh, cooperation of the German government, but also uh, is responsible for the instrument H2 Global, which was already mentioned several times in the morning. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to welcome um, uh, a colleague from the private sector from India, Vikram Kapoor. Welcome. Uh, Vikram is the chief growth officer of uh, Renew uh, Power, one of India's largest green energy companies. Uh, Vikram is there responsible for the green ammonia production and uh, the company's foray into international markets. Welcome, Vikram. Welcome to the whole panel. We will have a round of questions, uh, which I will um, ask to the panelists. Um, I would also like very much if you, the panelists, would engage with each other, um, but uh, we will uh, also try to uh, allow for a handful of questions towards the end of the panel if uh, time allows us. So I move over now. And my first question goes to the minister from, uh, from Argentina. It's, it's great to have you here. It's a great honor. Um, your country has really unparalleled uh, solar and wind potential and could really become one of the big uh, renewable hubs, but also possibly one of the um, emerging um, green hydrogen hubs of the world. And uh, we understand that uh, you are already trying also to, uh, to strategize and to understand how your country could really reap the benefits and avoid the pitfalls, uh, which is the title of our discussion. So maybe your opening statement, uh, you could uh, enlighten us a little bit about your plans and vision for, for, for Argentina in this uh, realm. Bueno, muchas gracias. En primer lugar, agradecer a la organización de este evento tan importante, la posibilidad de estar aquí conversando con ustedes de este tema clave, estratégico para, para el futuro de la humanidad. Eh, decirles efectivamente que consideramos que Argentina tiene un potencial enorme para el desarrollo del hidrógeno verde, es un país de una gran extensión donde la Patagonia, la región sur del país, posee vientos que son de los, de los mejores del mundo para hacer energía eólica y en el norte las provincias tienen niveles de radiación que muestran productividad que permite también la, la producción de energía solar en condiciones eh, muy significativas cuando se la compara con otros países del mundo. Así que efectivamente consideramos a Argentina un potencial muy importante, una, una extensión territorial que permite eh, el desarrollo de estas energías sin este, competir con otras actividades productivas, sin afectar a las comunidades, por el contrario, dándole grandes oportunidades a las comunidades para su desarrollo. Estamos eh, ya trabajando en, en un proyecto muy importante en la provincia de Río Negro que está avanzando muy bien con el liderazgo también de la gobernadora que está aquí presente, la gobernadora Arabella Carreras, y esto ha permitido este, ya empezar a trazar las posibilidades concretas de producir en escala este, hidrógeno verde en la provincia de Río Negro y ya hay otros dos proyectos también en estudio en Argentina. ¿Qué es lo que viene para adelante? Un, una ley que nos permita dar un marco general 
para las inversiones en este sector, el desarrollo de las infraestructuras necesarias para garantizar justamente un aprovechamiento de las inversiones que, que se van a realizar, poder darle oportunidades a las comunidades, desarrollar nuestro sistema científico, tecnológico, para que pueda también haber este, desarrollos nacionales y toda una red de proveedores industriales que potencien el desarrollo de esta industria en nuestro país. Para ser bien claros, estamos convencidos de que Argentina tiene la capacidad eh, hacia 2030 de estar produciendo alrededor de 10 millones de toneladas de, de hidrógeno verde, lo cual lo convertiría en un productor muy importante. Eh, depende de muchos factores, depende obviamente de que se estructure la demanda de ese hidrógeno verde, depende por supuesto de contar con el financiamiento y las inversiones, que vemos que estamos este, bien encaminados para lograrlos, y por supuesto depende de que este marco regulatorio que este, hemos comenzado a diseñar pueda efectivamente ir adelante. Hemos hecho una acción eh, muy fuerte con las comunidades para poder instalar esta temática y ha sido muy bien recibida. Estamos convencidos de, de que una economía verde, una economía industrial que produzca cuidando el ambiente y generando una solución, no con discursos, sino con hechos concretos al problema del, del cambio climático, el calentamiento global, está en nuestras manos. Así que transmitirles el entusiasmo que tenemos y el optimismo en que Argentina se va a convertir en esta década en un productor este, relevante a nivel mundial de hidrógeno verde. Uh, thank you, uh, Minister, for these uh, very, very interesting uh, insights, and we'll certainly uh, c come back to, to talk about um, in more detail about your plans. Um, I would now like to move to, um, to South Africa. Um, so far, um, South Africa also is richly endowed with land, with sun, with wind. You also have a very strong industrial base. You've also been engaged in the global energy markets uh, with, with coal coming from South Africa and, and uh, serving many parts of the world. We would also be very uh, keen to understand um, what is your strategy, uh, how do you uh, try to ramp up the market, what is ro the role for export that you foresee, and possibly also a little bit of a prediction when we can expect the first exports of green hydrogen from the coast of uh, South Africa. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, uh, greetings to my uh, esteemed panelists. Um, I think from a, a South Africa perspective, we, we really see sort of exports as well as uh, domestic decarbonization, not as uh, a binary question, but as a continuum. Um, you know, there is a price premium associated with green hydrogen, we all know. Um, the anticipated technology path, we understand what the potential looks like in terms of building economies of scale. Um, but within the short term, we see uh, exports as uh, uh, um, a potential short to medium term market, uh, best place to be able to absorb that price continuum as we then build technology expertise and knowledge, uh, uh, as well as economies of scale in, in terms of production, we then see the opportunity for that to filter further into the economy in terms of decarbonizing industry. Um, so our path very much is in terms of leveraging our sort of significant industrial base. We uh, have the largest industrial base on the continent as a, uh, an opportunity for domestic demand We see certain small to medium scale projects being able to meet that demand from a mobility perspective and others. Um, we are already a significant producer of gray hydrogen, so we have uh, industrial knowledge uh, uh, and process understanding. We produce approximately 2.4 million tons of gray hydrogen a year. Uh, so there's an opportunity to replace that with green hydrogen. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, assisting in this transition. Um, and we have projects which are moving from producing gray hydrogen uh, and changing the energy source uh, from fossil fuel based to renewables uh, that could be online as early as next year or the year after next. Um, there's a project that we'll be launching uh, um, within the next month which is looking to be able to produce amounts of green hydrogen next year. But those are for domestic demand. Uh, where we see the gigawatt scale 
uh, type projects that are aimed at the export market. Uh, initially, we had anticipated to have at least five gigawatts of uh, uh, electrolyzer capacity uh, under construction by 2025 uh, um, and producing a product for export by 2028. Um, given the sort of recent geopolitical tensions uh, on, on the continent in Europe, uh, all of those predictions um, have shifted significantly. What we understood was a best case scenario now probably looks like a base case scenario uh, where we anticipated the ramp up to happen in 2030. We're now anticipating 2026, 2027. Um, so for us, it's very much a push on how we can bring large scale projects into, uh, um, you know, into construction, get them to financial close as quickly as possible with government playing a uh, coordinating and convening role. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I guess um, when I think about that, that acceleration that, that you're talking about, it's, uh, it's, it, it gives me a good bridge to, to come to Elizabeth, because um, uh, that is partly caused by countries such as Germany and, and the demand uh, for coming from industrialized countries, especially also in, in Europe. Um, I mean, given the long-term uh, commitment of Germany to phase out nuclear, to phase out coal, but also now the, uh, the, the urgency, that big shock that is associated with the invasion um, uh, in Ukraine, um, can you tell us a little bit, share with the audience a little bit, what is the, the, the role that um, the German federal government currently foresees for green hydrogen to, to play in that long-term new emerging strategy. Uh, I, I know a lot of that is very recent and is really driven by, by an external shock now, but um, it would be very interesting, I guess, to hear from you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, it's very important for us, for Germany, to speak with our partners and to establish these value chains together, because Germany will heavily rely on the import of green hydrogen and also its derivates. And yes, uh, Germany is in a transition phase. So we are going to step out of nuclear by the end of this year. We are going to step out of coal, ideally by 2030. So these are political decisions that had been made. Um, and also we want to reach our climate targets by 2045 already. Um, so considering this, um, we came up with the energy transition triad that consists of, at first, um, energy efficiency, so be efficient wherever possible. Then the second pillar would be um, the direct use of renewable energy, so try to electrify every sector that can be electrified. And the third one is sector coupling, meaning using renewable energies also for sectors next to the electricity sector. Um, and um, coming back to your question, um, uh, what is going on in Ukraine right now? So, um, of course, gas has always only been a bridging option. So, to make that clear at first, we have our climate goals by, as I said, 2045. And um, we saw that we made ourselves really, really reliant on the import of just one supplier, which was apparently not the best idea in the past. So I think this is a big lesson learned now. Um, and like green hydrogen does not only give us the chance to um, decarbonize, decarbonize our market or our, our value chains, our economy, our industries, but also has the chance for more a brighter diversification of our energy supply chains. So it's also an issue of energy security at the moment. So um, yeah, last year we came up with a national hydrogen strategy and this year, the strategy is likely to um, to be renewed. And um, yeah, so we will build a lot of capacities as much as we can. But of course, we have limits. As you know, Germany is not the biggest country in the world. So we have uh, yeah limits of land. So we will rely on, on imports. So our um, installed capacity by 2030 will be roughly 10 gigawatts. But of course, we will need more. Um, 10 gigawatts will be about uh, 30 terawatt hours, but we would need um, around 100 terawatt hours. So 
yeah, roughly 70% of the demand of hydrogen um, has to be imported. Thank you very much, uh, Elizabeth, for this um, insight and uh, talked about mistakes being made in the past and it's really uh, maybe also the pitfalls that we talked about in this uh, um, um, plenary to, to really understand, no, to foresee, to project a little bit into the future and, and uh, not, not to make mistakes. Um, we come to India. Uh, Vikram, you do not only represent India, you also represent the private sector on this uh, panel. That's, it's great to have you here. And um, your, uh, India was also one of the first countries, early mover, to come out with a, with a quantitative target for the production of green hydrogen. Also, your, your um, prime minister has made very ambitious um, announcements in terms of where the industry should uh, go. So we would be very um, uh, keen to, to understand from a private sector perspective, uh, where do you see the, the sector going in the country and what is, what is it that you feel is really necessary in order to to move towards those uh, targets that were set politically so far. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you so much, uh, and uh, uh, my pleasure to be part of this esteemed panel. Uh, you know, I think uh, in 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 the last year's Independence Day speech, the Prime Minister of India declared that by 2030, India would produce almost five million tons of uh, green hydrogen. Right, and uh, uh, and to me. Uh, this is a target which we strongly as a country believe in because it's it makes political sense as well as economic sense, right? And let me just say a few words on both of them. One, uh, you know, India is the third largest consumer of energy globally after China and the U.S. And over the next 10 years, uh, potentially uh, the growth of that energy consumption, the growth rate will be amongst the highest uh, amongst large economies. Um, Unfortunately, it's today, 40% of India's energy requirements are imported uh, through either uh, oil and gas or coal. And uh, if uh, business as usual continues, this number grows to almost 50% by 2030. Right Now, that's a huge political vulnerability because that exposes the economy to uh, commodity price risk, foreign exchange risk. And therefore, the government is very committed uh, and uh, stated that, uh, you know, in, in its in, in its uh, search for energy independence, green hydrogen is right there, front and center, right? Now, luckily, we've also been endowed with uh, huge uh, uh, land, uh, sunshine, and wind. Uh, in the last decade itself, uh, the installed capacity for, uh, for renewable energy, solar and wind, has expanded to almost 150 gigawatts as we speak right now and that uh, 150 gigawatts will expand to almost 500 uh, gigawatts uh, going forward right so i think there is a there is a clear political will to continue this acceleration journey in search of that energy independence second uh, in this journey what has also happened is that uh, somewhere in 2017 2018 uh, renewable energy became the cheapest form of energy in, in the country right uh, our alternative used to be thermal uh, thermal coal uh, so, you know, that, that once the tipping point was uh, achieved, uh, you, know, you, know, you know, it was almost a hockey stick, stick acceleration, right? And, uh, and this tipping point uh, between uh, was achieved in less than a decade, right? It was six to seven years from when India started solar PV. And the belief, uh, the economic, therefore the economic rationale for green hydrogen is that we believe that in another five to seven years, even green hydrogen uh, would follow a very similar path where, where the green and gray uh, would uh, cross over and the green would become much more, uh, much more uh, uh, viable. Uh, so I think combination of those two things put together uh, makes, uh, makes, uh, makes us uh, very confident that uh, India will be very well positioned to produce uh, green hydrogen for exports uh, for, for countries like Germany, uh, but also for domestic uh, consumption within ourselves. And from a private sector perspective, what do you think are the the priority actions the government should should take? I I, I can I can think of three of them. Um, I think one to kickstart the domestic market. Uh, I do feel that at least in uh, in our part of the world, you would need to mandate uh, green hydrogen uh, purchases. Um, so I think the government is already thinking in those lines. 
and sectors like refining, uh, sectors like fertilizers, uh, and potentially sectors like steel would be mandated to use uh, green hydrogen over the short, short period of time to spur demand. Uh, I think there is also uh, going to be an ask on <clears throat> certain enabling policies to uh, bridge the green-gray uh, hydrogen cost gap. Uh, so the two or three distinct uh, conversations which are on the table are uh, things like uh, uh, waiving off the interstate uh, transmission charges, which would mean that you could have uh, the renewable energy uh, capacity in the best part of the country where the sun shines uh, and the wind, wind, wind uh, resources are the best. At the same time, you then transmit green electron to uh, places of consumption or places from where exports of green hydrogen can be much more viable, right? So sort of you delink the two, right? So that's one kind of policy which is being talked about. Uh, the second policy which is being talked about is uh, uh, is banking of electricity, uh, of green electricity, uh, which means you can produce more in the time the sun is shining, and then you can draw off the grid uh, when uh, during the night times, right? And in India, given the grid sizes of uh, substantial 200 gigawatts, I think some of that banking becomes uh, relevant. And last but not the least, I think there has to be uh, uh, there has to be some form of PPA. Uh, or, or um, uh, long-term contract to make the projects uh, viable. Right? From private sector standpoint, I would say those are the three uh, that uh, that will be uh, right on the top of the list. Thank you, uh, Vikram. I would like to uh, come back, Minister, to you. Um, we we understand that this what we're talking about here is not just a very quick fix. It's a very long-term um, transition. It's it's a long-term a strategy that is really needed uh, to to reap the benefits and avoid the pitfalls. So uh, in Argentina, how, how do you address that uh, that uh, sector or that, uh, that opportunity from a strategic point of view? Where do you stand with your own strategy process um, and, and, and how do you how do you manage that? Is that is a government driven in initiative? What role does the private sector play in this? Can you can you shed some light on, on your st strategy process in that field? Bien, muchas gracias por, por la pregunta. Bueno, en, en primer lugar, como mencionábamos, eh, estamos hablando de un, de un marco general, un marco que, que dé previsibilidad para los próximos eh, 30 años. Entendemos que esta es una transición que, que ya ha comenzado, pero que bueno, necesita pasos muy decisivos y darle certidumbre a los inversores nacionales e internacionales. Por eso un, un régimen especial. Lo segundo que me parece fundamental es poder realizar un trabajo de, de adaptación en el sector privado y sobre todo en el sector científico tecnológico. ¿Qué significa esto? Bueno, ir este, preparando estrategias de este, capacitación este, de, la, de la fuerza laboral para las nuevas actividades y nuevos oficios que van a ser demandados en esta, en esta industria, es algo que ya hemos empezado a realizar. En segundo lugar, este, generar programas de investigación en ciencia y tecnología para también este, ir mejorando la producción, los, el uso de materiales y todas las cuestiones que se relacionan con las tecnologías de, de producción de este combustible tan importante. Y en, en tercer lugar, este, naturalmente, lo que tiene que ver con la atracción de las inversiones, la, el financiamiento, obviamente para un país como Argentina, estamos hablando de, de un volumen de proyectos que claramente requiere complementar la inversión eh, nacional con la inversión internacional. Y estamos decididos a realizar este, esa complementación, siempre eh, también aprendiendo de experiencias del pasado. Las experiencias del pasado nos muestran también que históricamente en, en lo que son los proyectos vinculados a recursos naturales, hubo muchas situaciones de economías de enclave. ¿Qué significa esto? de inversiones que se realizan en, en países en desarrollo que muchas veces no transfieren tecnología, no están trabajando con, con las comunidades, eh, no desarrollan proveedores locales, no recurren a ciencia y tecnología nacional. Y eso este, ha generado en el pasado cierto rechazo de las comunidades. Entonces nuestra posición es aprender claramente de esos errores y desde el comienzo nosotros trabajamos justamente para desarrollar esas capacidades en nuestro país y que justamente la inversión este, internacional y también la nacional sea bien recibida, sea justamente un factor de desarrollo de todas las comunidades. Y trabajamos siempre 
con un principio de, de triple sostenibilidad. Es decir, la sostenibilidad ambiental tiene que estar necesariamente acompañada de sostenibilidad social y sostenibilidad macroeconómica. La sostenibilidad macroeconómica, obviamente, este, tiene que ver con que sean inversiones que nos ayuden a, a tener programas macroeconómicos estables, con balanzas este, superavitarias en lo, en lo comercial, que haga buenos aportes también a tener este, finanzas públicas este, sanas, equilibradas. Desde el punto de vista de la sostenibilidad social, apuntamos a la creación de puestos de trabajo de calidad y, por supuesto, como decíamos recién, que las comunidades este, se puedan beneficiar. Esta es nuestra este, posición, Creo, creemos que ha sido este, bien recibida, este, creemos que no hay espacio para, tampoco para proyectos que no piensen de esta manera. Creemos que este, no solamente como, como gobierno eh, no aceptamos ese tipo de, de enfoques este, que, que se desentiendan de las problemáticas eh, productivas, ambientales y comunitarias, sino que también la sociedad las va a, a, a rechazar. Así que esta es una invitación justamente a entender que el trabajo tiene que darse de manera mancomunada entre el sector público y el sector privado, y creo que estamos en un muy buen camino para lograrlo. Thank you, Minister. I'm very grateful that you that you bring up the uh, subject of sustainability, um, because uh, we, we we all understand that given the the, the let's say land requirement of uh, the renewables that are required for the green uh, hydrogen revolution, there will be conflicts. Um, we talk about resource availability, the resource of, of water, for example, that is discussed in many drier regions of the world that have strong sunshine but very little water. So there are many, many sustainability issues. We also have the emerging subject of the just energy transition, and probably you also want to share some insights uh, how that relates to each other, green hydrogen, but also the phase out um, of the transition away from, from coal in your country would be very interesting to hear also from South Africa. But I wanted to take the opportunity to, um, to um, inform you about an event that will going to take place tomorrow at this uh, assembly at a quarter past uh, one, I think, in one of the parallel rooms, Frank, right next, next door, or ne behind the wall, um, which will be a launch of a study uh, on sustainability dimensions and concerns addressing environmental, governance, economic, and social uh, sustainability dimensions of uh, green hydrogen and, and PTX. This is a, a, a brand new product that will be launched tomorrow by um, colleagues uh, who work for what is called the PTX Hub. It's an initiative uh, s uh, financed by the, uh, the German government that really tries to, um, to, to do the knowledge management and really identify the uh, underlying issues of the, uh, the green transformation that we are all after. And uh, there's a new product on sustainability criteria that will be launched uh, tomorrow at quarter past one, so you're all very warmly invited. Uh, I have a number of questions for my panelists here, but I would also want to check um, in the room. We have a very big audience uh, in the room, uh, I find, considering the fact that there are a number of parallel sessions. Uh, so I, I don't want to miss the opportunity to, to um, give uh, you and the audience the, uh, the opportunity to address your questions to our astute uh, panel here. So if, if there are any, I c the light is a little bit strong. Yes, I think there's one. Do we have a microphone, or do I have to share it from here? Maybe I'll bring it. Yeah, but then the translators cannot work. So Maybe you want to introduce yourself and then ask. Yes, well, I'm Mariana. I'm a student from Mesade, university student. Um, and, well, I would like to know basically what are the main challenges when exporting green hydrogen um, and, like, how to address them because I know that, for, well, this is one of the main bottlenecks right now because when exporting hydrogen, when you have to, like, liquefy it and stuff, sometimes the cost can increase and, therefore, it can be less competitive, um, well, against other types of, of uh, gray hydrogen and stuff. So my question is that, like, what are the main bottlenecks when exporting and how can we address them? Um, no, well, whoever can, yes. Okay, maybe I can, I can take another question if there is any. Ah, yeah, sorry. 
Uh, thanks. I am Husia Mikweli from Sasol uh, in South Africa. We are actually a petrochemical uh, a company, fully entrenched in our ambitions as well from a green hydrogen perspective. Masopa has mentioned some of the programs that we we, we really fully going to enroll, particularly with the technology that we have, which is fissure troughs, to be able to start converting some of the grey hydrogen that we are producing to green hydrogen. So quite excited with that. But mainly from my end is very excited that we've moved away from actually only discussing the merits of green hydrogen, but getting into the nuts and bolts of how we're going to implement this. But very key for me from an emerging markets perspective is we know the challenges similarly around scalability and affordability. And I would like to test a bit from the panel, not specifically to South Africa and Namibia ministers here in terms of how regional integration is being, 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 being leveraged. But I'd like to also understand from the other panelists, how are you leveraging your own regional, of course, geography dependent integration? And this is not only a supply issue. I think we tend to talk a lot from supply countries, what we're doing, but even from a demand perspective, infrastructure, as you say, shipping, how do we regionally integrate? And, and do we even leverage on that? And you can probably respond from your perspective of a country where you are from, thanks. Thank you very much. So I'll take these two questions back to the panel. Anybody ready to address the first question that was asked about the cost competitiveness of exports? Please. Thank you, Elizabeth. Yeah, maybe from the demand side, uh, because this is maybe a bit quicker, because I'm not on the, on the side on, in charge. Well, um, mm. I'm very thankful for that question. Also, what you, dear minister, already mentioned, that you are going to include the civil society, um, because this is what we also mainly try to do, because we also want to avoid the, the mistakes we made in the past. Um, for example, Desert Tech, there was a big initiative already taking place, but the civil society was not included, so the whole process failed. And we feel, um, from a demand perspective, if we don't include the civil society um, part, then we will fail again. So what we are currently doing, of course, we are all uh, deliberately waiting for the uh, delegated act of the <laughs> Renewable Energy Directive of the Commission. Um, but just, this is just one side. But when it comes to the more ecological um, sustainability or the social standards, we really need sort of a due diligence along the value chain of hydrogen. Um, and so what we do, for example, now we have, it was already mentioned, some um, also state aid program, programs, funding programs, for example, H2 Global, but it's just one example. And we really try to focus also on that. And for example, with H2 Global, we are currently um, yeah, implementing social standards, also ecological standards. Um, so with the help of international certification, um, companies because we can't cannot wait any longer so we cannot wait for a global initiative bringing the standard all together so we have to start now and so we are going to start with with the best benchmarks great thank you very much i would like to come to the second question that was asked about regional integration and the potential that uh, that uh, is associated and maybe we can have a south american perspective because it's not just argentina there's a whole lot of countries we heard from colombia we heard from chile uh, so, so how do you look at, at the, the opportunities for Latin America in a more regional perspective? Sí, sin duda que la región América del Sur este representa un, un, un espacio productivo fundamental para el desarrollo de, del hidrógeno verde y estoy seguro que eh, gradualmente iremos también generando una integración de las infraestructuras. Eh, está claro este, que el, el futuro de esta industria eh, está asociado a lograr eh, reducción de costos por la vía de eh, la escala, justamente aprovechar una, un, un incremento sustancial de la escala de producción y este, simultáneamente con aprovechar las mejores capacidades de producción, este, en nuestro caso, como estamos pensándolo, de energía eólica. Creo que esta, esta doble combinación sumado, insisto, ¿no? a inversiones que, que, este, que estén a la altura de esa demanda de escala y productividad, son las que van a llevarnos a que este combustible este, verde, 100% ecológico, sea competitivo en no mucho tiempo con los combustibles fósiles. Pero, insisto, aquí están, me parecen, los dos grandes retos y creo que estamos bien encaminados para lograrlo. Gracias. 
Thank you, Minister, uh, for this perspective. Um, anything you want to add to this? Sure, thank you very much. Um, I, I think I'll try and answer sort of both questions from a South Africa perspective. Uh, in terms of bottlenecks, um, they're not necessarily in the form of physical infrastructure, though that is a challenge. Um, if you sort of think of the project development life cycle, uh, the first thing is, um, you know, the security of demand. Uh, yes, there's programs like uh, H2 Global that give a sense of linking uh, uh, areas of demand with those of supply, but sort of the massification of such would assist in terms of providing additional commercial viability to what is frankly um, mainly private sector-led projects uh, in many parts of the world. Um, sort of the second aspect of that is that that then allows for sort of technology developers to come in and see a pipeline of credible projects moving sort of through pre-feasibility uh, uh, to financial close, um, and then the sort of the supply element then comes in. The sort of second missing part is sort of how do you move large-scale projects from pre-feasibility to feasibility type stage, and the funding required in order to uh, make that kind of leap from an investment perspective. I would sort of see those two within a project development element as sort of key challenges of addressing. Uh, from a regional integration perspective, um, you know, we are, are very close. Uh, we're borders with, uh, we share a border with Namibia. Um, Namibia is also has a massive renewable energy potential uh, and has announced to the world its intention of being a large player within the sort of hydrogen development and export uh, market. I think there's significant opportunities for us to collaborate. Our uh, presidents met last year and uh, green hydrogen was already identified as an area for collaboration. Um, we have a, a, a bi-national commission at a ministerial level that then looks at sort of how to take these elements and implementation forward. We both have uh, two large-scale green hydrogen production uh, projects that we've announced. Uh, ours is uh, in the northwest corner of the country, uh, called in an area called Bukhubai. Uh, it's a, uh, a project which the province and the country has been looking to develop in terms of a greenfields port project. Uh, and with the advent of green hydrogen, it uh, created the opportunity to develop a green hydrogen SEZ adjacent to that, uh, and that project we're now in the uh, sort of uh, a post pre-feasibility going into feasibility stage, and we're doing sort of master planning for uh, uh, an area that can produce about 40 gigawatts of electrolyzer capacity, so it's a significant project. That project is about 20 kilometers as the crow flies across the border from Namibia's mega project, so the opportunity uh, to collaborate, uh, share technology, and our uh, element has sort of advanced the uh, development of the port component, and uh, uh, then provides Namibia with an opportunity potentially to export their element uh, uh, through existing infrastructure that we would then develop, and it helps sort of bring the business case. So this element of collaboration is not just from a principal perspective, I think there's opportunity for mutual and shared benefit. And given sort of what we're now seeing in terms of the elements of demand, uh, we're no longer collaborating. The demand, though unspecific, generally is so significant that uh, there's opportunity for sort of mutual benefit. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's fantastic to see how many also co-benefits, spillover effects, and uh, and and um, mutual benefits this 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 technology can bring uh, across different elements of society, economy, but also in terms of uh, across borders, and maybe also help uh, regional integration in, in in a big way in in many parts of the world. It's very encouraging to hear that. Time's running out, unfortunately. We have to come to the let's say closing round. And um, I sort of do a little bit of a pro domo um, effort here because I work for an agency that uh, has as its core international co cooperation. And so I would like to invite all of you four to either 
put on the wish list or make a proposal for what needs to be done at the international level, be it bilateral or in a multilateral framework, to really support, facilitate the global market ramp up for this emerging um, uh, technology. Um, I take it in any order in which it comes to your to your mind. So um, anybody who has Vikram, please. So I think uh, I, to me, uh, to me, three things uh, come to mind. Uh, one, I think this. Uh, uh, definition that we just talked about potentially it's going to get launched of uh, what what does green hydrogen mean right at uh, I think that's essential and it's essential uh, because that from where we sit for example in India if we have to export out to a Europe versus a Japan versus a Korea I think we need a standard one single global definition right I think that's uh, that's one second uh, I think that there needs to be some version of a model contract Right, with some uh, broadly agreed pricing uh, guidelines, uh, 10 years, 15 year, 20 year offtake arrangements, because that is what will be required to uh, create uh, uh, a bankability. Like in hydrogen purchase agreement. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and are there some standard models there? And lastly, I would say that uh, technology in this space will continue to uh, evolve, uh, you know, and uh, how do we collaborate much more globally to ensure that, that that curve is much more steeper, right? Like someone said at the beginning of the conference, uh, what we don't have is time. Uh, so, you know, if we can collaborate across the globe around the technological innovations, I think that will be fantastic. Thank you very much, Vikram, and thanks for, for joining us on the panel today. Elizabeth, maybe yeah. to you. Uh, thank you. I Thanks also for your answers. Um, this is also exactly what I always or regularly perceive that actually the demand side is also like key to success because um, it's like a kind of a chicken egg problem. Um, so yeah, I see that like Germany could offer exactly that demand, um, but also what you say could offer also certain uh, type of technological know-how but it always depends of course on the on the partner country we are working this because every country is different every country has its own prerequisitions so um, yeah so also communication is key and to find um, I don't think that there's just one way to deal with this topic but with like every country every partnership individually Thank you very much, Elizabeth. Also, thanks to you for, for joining us here and sharing the perspectives from the German federal government with us today. Maybe from South Africa, final wish or proposal? <laughs> um, I think sort of uh, um, everybody is uh, uh, hoping for and wishing for sort of uh, additional allocations to H2 Global to massify that. But uh, I think I'll take that as a, a common uh, across the the entire audience. I think from a South Africa perspective uh, specifically, um, we see the opportunity uh, and the need to create sort of more direct partnership with uh, sort of areas of demand at a government to government level, which is something that we're already exploring, and more as an element of facilitating the business to business element, which is where we see this being led. Um, you know, the amounts of uh, uh, funding that we're looking at, the sort of rapid deployment of technology needs a conducive environment to be created for, for business effectively to allocate capital and, uh, 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 and seek returns in, in, in the effort of creating a greater good. Uh, and for us, it's about creating that conducive environment and finding sort of pa partner countries where we can develop a, a symbiotic relationship. Thank you very much for this uh, proposal and thanks for being with us here today and good luck with your endeavors in that uh, field for South Africa. So the last word is with our minister. Uh, um, from your perspective, what, what would you suggest or propose or wish for? Bien, muchas gracias y la verdad que primero suscribo a todas las, las respuestas que, que se han dado. Creo que los desafíos que se han planteado en este panel y en todo este encuentro son, son muy importantes y son este, muy grandes. Y está claro que esto no lo puede resolver, no, se, no lo puede dar respuesta eh, un solo gobierno ni el sector privado, sino que requiere justamente de la conjunción 
de intereses y de la cooperación internacional. Es, es imposible este, poder instalar un, un desafío tan grande desde lo tecnológico, lo productivo, lo comunicacional, de poder este, eh, justamente involucrar a la sociedad civil en semejante cambio. Así que celebro justamente que se estén desarrollando este tipo de, de eventos. Me parecen fundamentales justamente para poder aglutinar aquí todas las expresiones del sector público, el sector privado, gobiernos de diferentes países del mundo, poder intercambiar las experiencias y generar las soluciones que son necesarias. Así que felicitaciones, por supuesto, a esta organización de este evento. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I find it personally very encouraging in these challenging geopolitical times to see so much of expression, so many expressions of interest to really collaborate, work together, and uh, to to join hands and work for the, let's say, global benefit of of, of mankind, but also of, of of the globe as such. So. Thank you very much for this uh, for these discussions. Thanks to the um, convener of the assembly again for for having us here on the panel today, and I wish you uh, um, good success with the rest of the conference program today and uh, tomorrow. All the best. Thank you. Thank you.